Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Jordan Center. Um, welcome to everyone who's here physically, and also to everyone who's joining us um, on Zoom. Um, I see Jillian, so that's very good. Uh, so my name is Maya Vinicor, and I'm very happy to introduce the joint NYU and University of Colorado Boulder speaker series on Ukrainian energy studies, which is going to continue starting with this talk um, through the entire academic year 22-23. So I'm going to say a couple of words about the series, and then I'm going to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Margarita Balmaceda. So the origin of the series is a volume soon to be out with uh, Paul Grave on Russian and Soviet energy studies, which I've been working on with my colleague, Jillian Porter, um, who you can see here on Zoom, um, and she is in Colorado. But Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February confronted us with the urgency of thinking about energy in Ukraine specifically. Um, and so we wanted to organize the speaker series as a way to amplify voices actively working on the topic, um, on that specific topic. But uh, beyond creating a space for uh, the discussion of Ukrainian culture and politics through the lens of energy, we're also hoping that the series can open up a dialogue about energy as a phenomenon in general, so its history, its political uses, uh, its cultural dimensions uh, among scholars from many, across many different uh, humanities disciplines. So as I mentioned, this series is a joint project. So I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the support of co-organizers and sponsors. First, uh, uh, because I'm standing here specifically, thank you to the Jordan Center for its financial and technical support. And thank you to Sasha Shvitalik specifically for her um, for your logistical help in making all this happen. I'd also like to thank the East European, Russian, Caucasian, and Central Asian faculty network at SMU Boulder, especially my colleagues, Erin Hutchinson and Stacia Orsipova, who have been actively involved in planning the talks in this series. And then among other institutional sponsors and supporters beyond the Jordan Center, I want to mention CU Boulder's departments of Germanic and Slavic languages and literatures, history, geography and its program in international affairs and then a special sh uh, shout out is due to our latest sponsor CU Boulder's Department of Political Science thank you very much for also coming on board so um one small logistical thing before I introduce uh, Dr. Balaseda we've timed this event to coincide with the course that Jillian is teaching on also on energy culture, but unfortunately, um, I'm conveniently also teaching during the late afternoon today, and I will have to be early. Um, but Jillian will be here, um, at least virtually, to handle the Q and A uh, at the end of Dr. Balmaceda's talk. So thank you very much for bearing with me for this pre-introduction, and now to the actual introduction of our speaker. Margarita Balmaceda is professor of diplomacy and international relations at Seton Hall University in New Jersey. Concurrently, she is an associate at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and has the study group on energy materiality, infrastructure, spatiality, and power at the HBK Hansa Wissenschaftskolleg in Germany. Her research analyzes the connection among natural resources, international relationships, and political development with special expertise in energy politics, oil, natural gas, coal, nuclear renewables, steel, and the metallurgical sector in Ukraine, the former USSR, and the EU. Capitalizing on her Ukrainian, Russian, Hungarian, and German skills, in addition to her native Spanish, she has conducted extensive research in Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, Lithuania, Moldova, Hungary, Germany, and Finland. Her most recent book is called Russian Energy Chains, The Remaking of Technopolitics from Siberia to Ukraine to the European Union, uh, which came out in 2021 with Columbia University Press. Her other works include The Politics of Energy Dependency, Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania between domestic oligarchs and Russian pressure, which is from 2013, Living the High Life in Minsk, Russian Energy Rents, Domestic Populism, and Belarus's Impending Crisis from 2014, and Energy Dependency, Politics and Corruption in the Former Soviet Union from 2008. Her talk today is called Ukraine in Russian Energy Chains, Threat, Temptation, and Learning from the Past to Understand Ukraine's and Europe's Current Energy Challenges. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Balasir. Um, Before I get to my actual talk, I want to really emphasize how important this series is, how timely, how key it is, uh, for many, many different reasons. But I want to 
really congratulate Maya and, and Gillian and their supporters both at NYU and CU Boulder in supporting this uh, project. Uh, the idea of a year-long series devoted to issues related to Ukraine energy is key, not only because the ways in which the current uh, war of Russia against Ukraine has highlighted the interconnection between energy spaces, not only because energy has been so central for Ukraine, but also because many issues related to energy involving Ukraine raise and bring to the fore key concepts that are going to be very, very useful um, in understanding energy issues beyond Ukraine. Moreover, I want to salute uh, the organizers of this series for actually building a bridge between the energy humanities and more social studies and technical studies of energy. Uh, having working on energy issues for many years, um, I am certainly aware of the trend in the last um, decade or so towards um, work on energy humanities, but very few people um, actually do something to build a bridge between these, these discussions. And I think this is a very, very important contribution of this series. Um, the recent joining of the Department of Political Science, the sponsors of this series, is also a very good step in this direction. So, uh, chapeau, hats off to you. Um, so, um, I'd like to use <clears throat> uh, my time today, uh, and uh, wonderfully this coincides with the first uh, talk in the series, to present a number of issues and concepts uh, that are going to be, in my view, very important for understanding the current situation, the current crisis. But as a vehicle or, or as an excuse for this, I will be talking about uh, the book that uh, Maya mentioned, The Russian Energy Chains. I published this book last year. Um, uh, I spent seven years writing it. Uh, so obviously, I will not be able to cover everything that is in this book uh, in, in a half an hour. But I, will, I would like to highlight some issues and concepts that have played a role in my getting to this book, that have played a role in the book, and that can help us understand some of the issues at, at play here. Again, I cannot summarize a 500-page book in half an hour, but I want to give you a sense of how some concepts that I work with in this book can help us understand uh, Ukraine's energy situation and that of other um, European and post-Soviet states. So what I would uh, like to do, first of all, is I'd like to give you a sense of how I got to this topic, how I got to this book. And um, unfortunately, I'm the kind of person who spends years deciding <laughs> the topic of a book and then more years <laughs> writing books, so I'm very slow. But I want to give you a sense of that process because it helps highlight um, the key issues uh, that I'm focusing on, on here. So I'd like to give you a little bit of the prehistory of, of, of here. When I started to work on post-Soviet energy, and in particular in Ukrainian energy, um, about two decades ago, um, it, it started my work, or the direction I took in this uh, field, was very much motivated by my dissatisfaction with the very crude way in which the idea of a Russian energy weapon was used. Now, Speaking to you here in September of 2022, I cannot deny that there is a Russian energy weapon, but the way this concept was used, and still is used in some ways, was highly problematic. Um, what bothered me, and I'm talking here about uh, processes going on about 15 years ago, was the way in which energy, the energy behind this quote-unquote energy weapon, was treated as an undifferentiated whole. Energy without any attention to what kind of energy or how it works. Um, uh, the discussion of the energy weapon never, it was, did not discuss technology, did not treat technology seriously. It was kind of a blank term that was supposed to cover everything. Um, and moreover, what really bothered me as a person who uh, did a postdoc on Ukrainian studies and who has devoted a lot of time to understanding Ukraine is that it did not treat the concept of Russian energy weapon at that time did not treat energy dependent states in the former Soviet Union as actual historical subjects. It rather used this blanket concept to see this or to present this as 
victim entities with little agency of their own. And that really bothered me because if we're supposed to support the states, but we are denying them agency, that's a problem. And that really, um, that really motivated me. So the first thing I did um, was I tried to understand what is happening inside this quote unquote helpless victim entities that had been basically objectified through the concept of energy web. So everybody was talking about the supplier, Russia, about the energy weapon. And then that's where it ended because nobody really wanted to look at the black box in the energy dependent states themselves. Uh, maybe it was too difficult, languages, issues, you couldn't really do it just looking at Russia. And basically what I did is I spent a lot of years looking at this black box. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the issues I looked at in this black box, which are still um, important. So the first thing I did, um, so looking at this black box uh, involved uh, understanding who were the winners and losers of different types of energy policies, including relations, energy relations with Russia, trying to understand issues of governance, who was making energy policy. And I did this basically through three books. I agree that I apparently overdo things because <laughs> I ended up writing three different books on different aspects of this issue. Um, in the first book, uh, which is a book uh, totally devoted to energy corruption in Ukraine and to the use of energy policy in Ukraine for other purposes, um, I basically try to understand, well, what domestic political factors support or hinder the development of coherent energy policies? And for the period I studied in this book, uh, which I call the classic period in Ukrainian energy policy, I can discuss that later why I say that, um, basically energy policy was used for some other goals, not really for energy policy. Um, uh, we can discuss that uh, later. Um, in a second book, I try to understand how do we explain different responses to the common challenge of energy dependency on Russia? How does the political system or the political situation in different states, in different post-Soviet states, explain or how does it relate to the way the states are managing the energy relationship with Russia? And I did this by comparing the cases of Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania. My original intention with this book was to understand how the political system in each of these states, which was a very different political system, affected energy policy. That was my original goal. But what I ended up finding out is that actually the way you manage that energy policy had a feedback effect and came to affect the political system as well in different ways in the two cases, of course. And finally, I wrote a totally separate book on Belarus uh, where through the lens of oil refining, <laughs> I analyzed the question of how a small, apparently client state can manipulate its patron state and how that manipulation, both financial, um, material, and discursive can be used for the maintenance of authoritarian regimes. So in all of these books, and I spent a lot of time working on them because I'm very slow, um, the key idea was that there was something going on at the domestic level, in the governance level, um, uh, there was something about corruption. So that's kind of the emphasis I had in that work. And I think it's, it was worthwhile, it was important, and I'm glad I did it. Um, what only became clear later on was that the um, ambiguous attitudes towards participation in Russian energy games or Russian energy chains that I unveiled in, in those books, because certainly uh, if you look, for example, at the book on, on Ukrainian energy corruption, uh, obviously a lot of that energy corruption was in cahoots or in agreement with players in Russia. Um, a lot of that discussion of ambiguous attitudes towards participation in Russian energy games and Russian energy chains was understood through the lens of governance and corruption. And that is fine. But actually, there is a certain ambiguity and a certain dualness of that relationship that goes beyond governance and beyond corruption. And Unfortunately, it, had to, it took me like 12 years <laughs> to understand this, but 
The point here is that even if you would leave corruption aside for a moment, which in some places was very difficult to leave aside, there were still um, there was still a tension between various goals. For example, on the one hand, the goal of energy independence from Russia, a declared goal in all the states, or at least in, in Lithuania and, and Ukraine. But on the other hand, participating in those relationships, participating in those Russian energy chains, even if you left corruption aside, strengthen that country's bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis Russia, allowed uh, that country to maintain a certain leverage in the relationship, allow that country to maintain um, certain access to spill over profits from Russian energy exports, uh, allow the country to, to have a certain de facto level of security guarantees. If you uh, have read the, the beginning of this book, already in the first two pages, I present this dilemma concerning Ukraine and Nord Stream 2. Uh, Ukraine not wanting Nord Stream 2 to happen, but wanting to remain part of that of those Russian energy chains. Uh, concerning security guarantees, for Ukraine to remain a key transit player was very important because it maintained Ukraine as a key player in a European context, whereby, whereas had Ukraine been set aside from the transit play uh, game, that importance would not have been there. So um, what I try to do in this, in this new book is to understand the issue of that duality in the relationship, not only from the lens of governance and corruption, but through the lens of technology. And to do this, I have to uh, understand what are the economic and technological aspects that make participation in those Russian energy chains, not only about threat, but also about temptation, and not only for corrupt actors. Um, and to do this, um, I go back uh, to that first slide where we had the idea of the supplier country. Um, to do that, I say, of course, we cannot simply look at supply, we need to look at the entire chain. So to do that, I look at the entire chain of Russian energy exports through countries like Ukraine and try to understand how that threat and opportunity or temptation, how do they interface, but through the lens of the entire value chain. So uh, when we're talking about those value chains, uh, we're usually uh, talking about upstream, midstream, and downstream. Uh, conveniently, especially given the title of this book, conveniently the upstream is usually in Siberia with the production of natural gas, oil, and coal in, in western, in northern western Siberia, middle western Siberia, and southern western Siberia. The midstream uh, in many cases coincides with Ukraine and the downstream or final markets in the European Union, and in the case of this book, in Germany. So I look at that at those entire value chains and um, I, act, I analyze three actual verified chains and basically I look at that molecule of natural gas, of oil, coal that is going from production in Siberia, in Western Siberia, to end use in Germany and try to understand through that journey, how does the threat and temptation manifest itself and how does technology play a role? So the central questions I try to understand in this, uh, try to understand through this book, um, the key question that motivated me was a question about material. How do the distinct physical characteristics of different energy types affect power relations around them? Um, we kind of knew already before that whether you import oil through a tanker or whether you import natural gas via pipeline, that is different. But what I wanted to do with this book was to take a step farther and look at how those differences in materiality also affected the domestic power of energy. So not only the power over 
created by energy, but the power to the power of energy and energy goods to support political actors and projects. And that difference between power to and power over is very important conceptually in the book. So that was the theoretical question that I wanted to analyze and to understand. But in doing that, I also look at the empirical question of how has participation in Russian energy chains affected power relationships um, and how did it shape um, political life in post-Soviet societies. And what I try to do is I try to analyze this um, theoretical question, but in, in doing that, I also try to build a framework that would make this book useful, not only for people interested in theory, but for people interested in understanding three different energy types through three areas, uh, Russia, Ukraine, the European Union, um, in an easy to follow way through the travel load of these molecules. And also I tried to bring in technology. I mentioned that technology was very important, but I tried to make it easy on the reader. Um, and in particular, by having a, a glossary of technology uh, terms used and entrusting the reader to put the effort to learn about that technology through this book and, and other uh, sources to really understand how energy may be used domestically and external for power purposes. Um, so when we talk about threat and temptation, we can talk a lot about Ukraine, but let me just flag the fact that for other former Soviet states, that balance between threat and temptation in participation in Russian energy chains was there and continues to be there. If you look at the case of Lithuania, which we see as the vanguard country in terms of moving away from Russian energy, but actually even Lithuania wanted to continue to be part of Russian natural gas transit, for example. Certainly in the case of Belarus, we see that threat and temptation very strongly there, maybe the temptation stronger than the threat. And even if we look at the European Union states, as has been unveiled in the last few months, that temptation of participating in Russian energy chains was really, really key. And if we look at what is happening in Germany now, uh, that becomes very clear. What are some of the results of that? What is the dark side of the positive aspects of temptation that were there? Um, so uh, what I'd like to do uh, now is just to focus on a couple of, of about four or five concepts, which I discuss in this book, which I think can also be helpful as we try to understand what is happening now. Um, the first concept is materiality. Now, I have an entire study group in Germany devoted to materiality. And when I started this group, I thought it was going to be six um, wonderful, world famous scholars just developing my view of materiality. Apparently, they each have their own view. <laughs> so uh, there is debate about what materiality means. But in, in, the, in this book, materiality is understood. Um, as the physical characteristics of different types of energy and how they impact on what you can do with it technologically and then politically. Other people see materiality differently, including the people in my own working group. I couldn't convince them to switch over to my view. Um, but um, for the purpose of this book, it's understood in this manner. And let me just for a moment give you a glimpse of how this works, how this impact works in the case of natural gas, oil, and coal. So in the case of natural gas, the key element of materiality here is the fact that natural gas in its um, original form when it comes out of the ground is a gas, is lighter than air. That is going to be key throughout the entire value chain. And this, the fact that natural gas is lighter than air, the fact that natural gas, if it is not contained, it will dissipate. The fact that natural gas needs to be under pressure for, in order to move at all makes the issue of pressure a central one. That is why the uh, chapter on, on natural gas in, in this book is called Managing Pressure from Western Siberia to the Nuremberg Power Plant in Germany. Of course, you can understand pressure as political and also uh, physical. In this case, it's mainly physical. And that need. Is, is really key. So basically, the entire natural gas value chain is an enterprise in managing pressure. Not only because you need to have natural gas under pressure for it to move, but also because if you do not limit that pressure, you may have huge accidents 
as we saw in Andover uh, in the Boston area where I live uh, a few years ago. So this is going to be really important because that role of managing pressure is central to the enterprise means that you need extensive capital investments higher than for oil in moving that um, good to the system. The system needs to be in sync. It's a networkness that is really, really important. So everything is kind of a network. But in the case of natural gas, that network really needs to be in balance. Because if not, you will have really serious problems. Um, um, all of this has impacts having to do with how do you manage the pressure? What is the role of countries like Ukraine in managing the pressure? Um, what is the role of storage, not only as storage for the winter and in terms of prices, but in terms of managing pressure? Can you commodify natural gas when storage is such a problematic issue? Um, how easy it is to have accounting transparency in this kind of situation? So the, the materiality of natural gas through the issue of pressure becomes uh, central. Um, and in terms of impacts, um, it also uh, has a lot of consequences that are very key today. Because, for example, um, when Russia says, well, we will sell our natural gas to China, and maybe not to Europe if Europe doesn't really want it, that's not so easy because you need a very dedicated infrastructure. Of course, you need infrastructure for everything. But when managing pressure is so key, that becomes more of a challenge. Um, if we look at the case of oil, <clears throat> what is really important here is that we have a high value, um, high volume, sorry, high value concentrated volume good that is liquid, so it's much easier to transport, many more um, alternatives than in the case of natural gas. And in the case of oil, heterogeneity of the good is at the forefront. Now, there is heterogeneity in natural gas as well. Uh, but in the case of oil, this heterogeneity, these differences between different types of oil are more pronounced. And, and here I have to give a nod to the energy humanities, that heterogeneity has been discursively and market-wise managed in a certain way that has reified and super emphasized those differences. So basically here we are talking about the different oil brands with different prices. So you may be familiar with tech, West Texas Intermediate or with Brent, or you may be familiar with Urals, uh, the Russian export brand. And the existence of these different oil brands is going to be really important uh, because in combination with the existence of different oil products, which are produced at different stages of the refining process, this is going to allow for a lot of manipulation of markets and a lot of alternatives in markets. So for example, now when European Union countries have been discussing stopping imports of Russian oil, um, this has not really worked very well because you have many, many countries still willing to import that oil. Now, how does that relate to materiality? How does that relate to those different brands? Well, it relates to those different brands very much because even when the European Union has eschewed purchases of that um, trademark uh, Russian brand Urals, you have other types of Russian oil that may be sold to different markets. You also have different games that can be played with differential in price between Urals and Brent. And you also have, and this is really amazing, a lot of very interesting domestic politics within Russia with different brands of oil. And I'll talk about that uh, later. Um, it also affects the very, very current issue of price caps. The G7 and the EU are discussing currently whether they will set a price cap on Russian oil and take it or leave it, uh, Russia would have to agree or to sell this uh, oil at this price because this is how much European Union will, will pay. But that 
the existence of those different brands, the existence of those different oil products make it much more difficult for that to work. Um, in the case of coal, um, we have a good that is low value and bulk cargo, highly heterogeneous, very all over the place in terms of caloric value, ex, uh, requiring of extensive human intervention, and uh, very, very important in terms of how it can be manipulated also discursively uh, in terms of certain policy uh, decisions and, and policy issues. So for example, uh, when I look at, at the case of the coal um, industry in Ukraine and coal mines in Ukraine, while everybody else in Europe and even in Russia was trying to get rid of economically unviable mines, Ukraine was trying to keep them afloat because of the social element. Um, coal is also very important because it's key to two value chains, the electricity value chain, which of course you have been reading a lot about this because in the last months, European countries are going back to coal uh, as a way to perhaps uh, use less Russian gas, but also really important in the steel uh, value chain to the role of coke and coal and coke in the blast furnace. Um, so this is kind of um, a very small glimpse of how the materiality of these three, three key fossil fuels can affect political relationships around them um, and can affect power relations around them. Earlier on, I mentioned that I was interested not only in power over, but also power to. And if you look at the case of coal in Ukraine, for example, you can see an entire political system in Donetsk, but also ramifying to the entire Ukraine based on how coal and the link between coal and steel was built in the 1990s. I speak a lot about that in chapter six of, of the book. Um, the second concept, which is really important in, in this book is the idea of an entire value chain analysis. Um, again, not simply looking at supply, but the entire chain. And here I spend a lot of time uh, thinking, should I use the concept of supply chain or value chain? Uh, basically, I, after a lot of discussions and a lot of thinking, I decided to go with the idea of a value chain. Supply chain puts the emphasis on the good itself, on the material good. But when you add the element of value, this is really important because it allows you to pay more attention to the fluctuations in the value. Even you may have a situation where an end product may have less value than a feedstock. That makes no sense, but that is the reality. And you need to understand that. You need to be aware of that and open to that to really understand what is happening. So for example, you may remember that in March of 2020, oil futures went to minus $30 per barrel. How can that be? That is crazy. How can that be? That is impossible. It had to do with the lack of availability of um, storage, for example, but the point I want to make here is that you need to look not only at the supply chain of a good kind of becoming bigger and bigger or having more and more value. If you look at value chain, you can capture a lot of those fluctuations which are also going to be very important in redistributive terms and also in terms of economic power. Um, I also um, open the door to the idea of the energy industrial chains, that is, uh, those fossil fuels we're talking about are not simply diverse in terms of those oil brands or those oil products, but they are used for industrial processes like fertilizers, chemicals. And that is a whole issue that is not really in the radar, but it's really, really important. And all of this is super key for understanding sanctions because you may sanction Russian natural gas, but that Russian natural gas may not appear to you dressed as natural gas in a beautiful blue shirt. It may appear to you as fertilizer, or it may appear to you as feedstock for the chemical industry. Um, or that Russian oil that you're trying to sanction, for example, when a few years ago, the European Union tried to sanction Belarus and export of oil, that, that oil may not come to you in the form of oil, but may come to you in the form of 
lubricants. Again, that's why looking at this entire chain is so important. Uh, the third key concept here is the concept of energy political systems. And basically what I'm trying to get at here is that energy systems produce much more than just electricity or heating. They produce a lot of other things. Um, I have concentrated mostly in the post-Soviet world, but I'm sure we could do this graph for other societies as well. They produce rents for sure, and profits. They produce currency for bargains, and certainly I saw that very clearly in the case of Ukraine, especially when I work on corruption in Ukraine. They produce, of course, employment. They produce systems of social provisioning. And to understand energy, you need, you need to look at it as part of that system, a system that is not simply uh, a straight line going from the fossil fuel to the electricity or produce or heating, but where a lot of that energy is also used for other uh, goals or goods. Um, a fourth key concept is the impact of contractual nodes. And here I want to take a step back and contextualize this discussion into the issue of space and nodes. So when I started working on this book, it was really important for me to think about nodes where things happen, where prices change, where ownership changes, where a good is transformed, refineries, ports, all of that is important and it is very important. But what I understood when I tried to conceptualize that energy space was that looking only at material technological nodes was not sufficient. You needed to look at regulatory nodes, that is those places where regulations concerning certain value chains and supply chains uh, take place. For example, Brussels or national governments where that those decisions are made. But you also need to look at contractual nodes, commercial nodes, where contractual regulations concerning a good are taken. Now, again, it's very hard to conceptualize this in spatial terms because the kind of space that each of these um, types of nodes is uh, referring to is different. I don't have a slide with this, but if you look at page 35 of my book, I have here a very interesting graph, I think, uh, where I explain how these different types of nodes interface as spatial. But this is just um, an excuse for um, telling you how important contractual regulation is. We may think that political regulation by the European Union or by Germany or national state is important, domestic governance, sure it is. But contractual regulations, the kind of quote unquote devil in details, is really important. And um, it's very, very important also for understanding how a country could be dependent, for example, on an energy good, let's say from Russia. But if you have different types of contracts, that diversifies your risk. Whereas if you look only at supply, you may not be cognizant of those differences. Um, this is also very, very important in terms of understanding the impact of the way the Soviet Western European energy relationship was built. I'll get to that in a moment. But those contractual regulations, again, not laws, just commercial contracts, can become really, really important at many, 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 many different levels. And I'll, I'll try to get to that a, a bit later. Um, the last concept I highlight in the book is how the threat and temptation aspects, how that balance or tension between threat and temptation on the interfaces with the war on Ukraine. And basically here, we need to look at what that temptation meant for Western European players. What that temptation meant in terms of Western European players acquiescing and supporting projects such as Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2, which basically removed Ukraine or tried to remove Ukraine from that transit role. Um, 
And this particular opportunity or temptation allowed Western European players to make a lot of profits from their participation in Russian energy chains, uh, but it also helped Russia fill its war chest, now used against Ukraine. Um, and those joint EU-Russia profits made it very easy to neglect Ukraine in the discussion. Um, if you dig deeper, or if you ask me to discuss it in more detail, I, will, I would say that that neglect of Ukraine was not only due to that economic temptation, it had to do with certain views of Russia versus Ukraine. We can talk about that later. Um, and um, the other key point here is that that tension between threat and temptation also reflected itself in tensions within European Union policy. And basically, European Union policy found itself in the years, in the last uh, few decades, in a tension between, on the one hand, emphasizing security of supply um, in the wake of the 1973 oil crisis, at the same time, as a result of transatlantic, transatlantic trends, uh, Chicago School and more, emphasizing liberalization of industries, especially so-called network industries, from phones to post office, to gas networks, and then in the last 10 years, decarbonization. And the fact that you had an European Union policy that had these different elements in tension made it very hard for the European Union to, de to, devote, to develop a very clear policy vis-a-vis -vis Russian energy. Um, so um, I have a lot of more things to say, but I simply want to um, have perhaps stay with just two more slides where I want to discuss what are some of the broader synergies of this work with larger issues in social sciences research. Um, and these are things that I have not discussed in detail, but are also in the book and are very important. So um, materiality and threat and temptation also relate to the role played by energy distribution and redistribution in the management of center periphery relations and also inter-ethnic relations. If you look at the case of Russia, within Russia, this is very clearly seen in the selective use of technology. So there is a couple of pages in the book where I discuss the issue of different brands of oil within Russia and what type of oil Russia is exporting and whether Russia is seeking to differentiate those brands to get the maximum uh, profit. There is technology that you can use to separate those oil flows in the pipeline to extract the maximum export profit from each. In the case of Russia, that was consciously not done. Why? Because to have done that, it would have unveiled the lower quality and the lower price of Bashkortostan and Tatarstan oil. It would have reduced the income to those regions because it would have limited that, that income as related to the price on, um, of those goods and it was decided to better not to separate those uh, streams and just assume that it's all a single uh, mixed type of oil. Um, energy redistribution and management also unveils the role of energy career paths, trans-ethnic trans and trans-regional energy career paths in the management of ethnic relations and you see that very clearly in this book through the prominent role of actors from the North Caucasus, Chechnya, Azerbaijan, in the Soviet uh, period. Um, and obviously it raises the issue of the um, multi-level governance at the EU level, national level, corporate level, contractual level. Um, what is the scope of each of these types of governance? Um, I also think that the work I've done in this book synergizes a lot with uh, work in the energy humanities. This is not something I have worked a lot on myself, but these are certain th several things that um, come to mind immediately. Um, so there is the whole idea of the energy threat that I have problematized in my work and also in this book. Um, so the question arises, well, how does the idea of being under threat synergize 
or not synergize with the idea of agency as a, as a philosophical level, agency of the entity under threat, but also how the concept of threat, and in particular energy threat, is used discursively by different actors. Certainly, I am aware of the way the, the idea of the Russian energy weapon was used by US uh, political players, but the idea of energy dependency as threat was also used actively by domestic actors in Ukraine, for example, even while that dependency on Russia was maintained. And you see that uh, in President Kuchma, you see that even after 2014 in people like Igor Kolomoisky, who, unfortunately, I don't have the video here, but while seeking to take over an entire uh, state company, Ukrnafta, justified that using the words of um, support, uh, defending Ukraine against so-called Rasiski diversanti, Russian um, saboteurs. Um, and another very important connection with the energy humanities and the discursive level comes with the idea of materiality. So I explained to you my view of materiality, but what has become clear also through the work I have done in this book is that, yes, there is materiality as hardware, which is how I understand it, but materiality as software is also important in the way different actors have used materiality and materiality related arguments to support certain perspectives or policies and for example in the case of the soviet union and russia the idea of natural gas as a quote unquote natural monopoly as something that can only be productively exploited by one company was certainly used as a very important discursive element uh, to keep the prominent role of Gazprom. You may want to look at the war of Susan Wengel um, uh, on this issue, um, uh, on, on, on the discursive role of the concept of natural monopoly in Russia. But in the case of the European Union, you had Another example, you have the situation where the idea of networkness was used to reify certain policies. So we know that natural gas is networked at a different level than other types of energy. Natural gas and, and electricity are networked at a much deeper level than oil, for example. That is important, but for the European Union, the concept itself of networkness became a justification for treating natural gas as a sector in a totally different way than the other sectors were treated. Um, related, creating much more uh, policies for security of supply in natural gas than in the other uh, sectors. So I think this is, um, this is really uh, important. I want to end up by just uh, mentioning two other things. Uh, if we want to understand what is happening today, we need to look at the beginning of Soviet fossil fuel exports to Western Europe, and in particular, to the beginning of Soviet natural gas exports to Western Europe in the 1980s. What is important here, in my view, is that this was not simply a system imposed by the Soviet Union. It was a system actively and proudly co-constructed by Western European players and Soviet players. It was a system that not only built an export pipeline, Druzhba, Ratzva, whatever, it built an entire system of distribution within Central and Western Europe. But, and I go back here to what I mentioned before, it built an entirely new contractual system that has been basically key in Europe until five years ago. Um, having to do with what you can do with the natural gas, whether you can resell it, not resell it, how you establish prices. And that system was proudly built by both sides. And I want to nod to a book by Per Proxelius. Per Proxelius is a Swedish historian of science. He's also a member of my study group in Germany. It's a wonderful book called Red Gas. And if you want to understand that pride, that co-creation of a system, um, I think you, you would be um, well advised to read uh, this book. I have a lot of other things to discuss and mention. I'm going to leave it at that here.
And depending on how the discussion goes, I may bring in a couple more slides or a couple more issues. Um, for now, I want to just um, thank all the people who supported my work on this book. And um, I'm happy to invite you to join me on Twitter. And I'm happy to uh, engage and discuss. Wonderful. So thank you so much, Margarita. Um, I'm sure we have a lot of questions. And I do want to just mention that Per Hoxelius, who you were just speaking about, will be speaking in this series later this fall. So um, um, any questions from anyone in person? Can you please elaborate a little bit more on the concept of materiality? I'm not sure I fully followed. Sure. Uh, could you remind me who you are? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. My name is Anastasia. Uh, Anastasia I'm here uh, as a postdoc. Excellent. So, so what is your field? Um, it's uh, a political economy. I, I study um, decentralization in Ukraine. So not fully in your field, but really. Political economy, very important. So um, in my view, uh, materiality relates to how the material and physical qualities of a good affect what you can do with it. So again, let me take the case of natural gas. How the fact of natural gas being a gaseous substance affects what you can do with it. That is my view. Um, other people have different views. And in fact, uh, we co-wrote an article with my colleagues in, this, in the study group, including Pep, uh, where we analyze different perspectives on materiality. But for now, let me just explain why, because some people see materiality as also having to do with the discursive uh, use. I see it more narrowly, like how does the characteristics of this good affect what you can do with it? Um, how does its, for example, its energy density, you have some energy goods which are, you need more of them to produce a certain amount of electricity. Um, that would be related to materiality, or which are easier to transport, or harder to transport, or which um, have a larger CO2 um, content. So for me, these are elements of materiality. Now, for other people, including my own study group colleagues, uh, they may see materiality in terms of the infrastructure that is uh, built to deal with those characteristics, or even the discourses. Um, so um, I don't know whether that answers your question, no, no, but um, there is there is a diversity of views. I still think my view is the best, <laughs> but um, there, there are um, a number of different views of materiality. Mine perhaps would be more narrow uh, view of materiality. Thank you. Um, we take uh, yeah. So let's. I kind of like it relates also a bit to what Master said. So I'm Natalia Lass. I'm also a postdoc here. And I'm historian of the Soviet Union. So I kind of like understood that like this infrastructure is also part of how you understood materiality. So my question kind of relates to this. So I was like really curious what you think about what's going on in uh, today's uh, Russian you know, energy sector, especially with this really like keeping in mind this uh, question of infrastructure and materiality and, and what we can do with this type of energy. Like you mentioned a little bit that. It's kind of it would be like really problematic to switch to China immediately because you know gas requires this like very complex infrastructure to keep it running. So I'm curious if you would kind of expand a little bit and explain to us uh, what might happen or like what options or limitations. Well, I think the first thing we need to understand about the Russian energy sector, and actually this goes this predates the all-out invasion of Ukraine in February 24, is the fact that the Russian leadership has been in denial about climate change and what states move away from fossil fuels may mean for Russia. So um, the Russian leadership, even Russian energy companies, have been very, very slow to start thinking about alternatives to fossil fuels. Um, that they can get away with using those fossil fuels domestically? Well, perhaps they can, but as more and more states move away from fossil fuels, it's going to be hard, even if we forget for a moment the, the new invasion of Ukraine, it's going to be harder for Russia 
to export those fossil fuels. And unfortunately, uh, Russian actors have been totally neglectful of that uh, of that issue. That is going to be a problem in the future, not only because there will be less importers of Russian fossil fuels, even leaving aside the war, but also because all those goods that Russia produces, which uh, have a very high embedded carbon content, industrial goods, which use a lot of fossil fuels either in, as electricity or in other ways, that are, they are going to be harder to export because of changing regulations in the European Union and perhaps in the US. So that is a key issue. The second issue concerns the illusion that the Asian markets will be a real alternative. So now they have been in the last month an alternative, um, especially oil exports by tanker to India, Brazil, Sri Lanka. Um, but in the long term, the idea that the Chinese market will save uh, Russian production will be a real alternative. I don't think that this is um, a real alternative because of the way the Chinese have dealt with price negotiations. This has not been very uh, profitable for Russia, and also because of the sheer need to build an infrastructure that is still not there. So this is my, my short answer uh, to the question. Okay. Sure. Hey, I am Jeff from the Center for Global Affairs. We're on MS uh, and Global Affairs and Energy Policy right now. Okay. Um, so I think the technical side kind of spoke to me a little bit more. But uh, does your book speak a little bit more on the agency of, say, Ukraine or some of these post-Soviet states specifically a little bit more? Because you spoke about uh, you know these these contracts between, say, the EU and Russia, and how something like Nord Stream One and Two are something they both. Uh, um, well, I don't think it is. Um something that I discuss so much in this book, okay. but I think in, in my other book on Ukraine, my other two books I did with Ukraine, I certainly do. But I think the the issue of agency uh, interfaces with the issue of technology. When you look, for example, at the role of Ukraine in managing pressure, if you look at the Ukrainian natural gas system and how it has played a really, really important role in the managing of natural gas pressure that is very important for Russian exports, that gives you a sense of, of Ukrainian agency. Now, agency is not always used in the best possible way. Agency is not always used for the good of the nation. Uh, but we can see already from the 1990s that there was agency on the Ukrainian side, even if that agency was not used to become less dependent on Russia. Thank you. Okay, I think we can go to Zoom, Jillian. Okay, uh, we have a question in the chat from John Feldman, uh, who asks, given all the discourse regarding energy dependency on the Russian Federation, what are the actual historical counterfactuals of this dependency? In a word, what were the alternative possibilities for Western and Eastern Europe regarding energy po policy? Uh, what were or what are? Uh, what were? So I think, you know, what could have happened that didn't happen is- so the, first, the first thing that could have happened that didn't happen was a real move to renewables. And what we have seen in the last months is that actually you can move to renewables if you want to, uh, but there was no political will to move to renewables. Um, the second thing that could have happened, and of course this is very different um, depending on what country you are dealing with, was the use of nuclear power. Um, so is nuclear power an alternative? Yes. Is it a political alternative? This is different in, in different states. It was certainly an alternative for Ukraine, and it was used. It was an alternative for Lithuania, and it was used. It was an alternative for France, and it was used. It was an alternative for Germany, and it was not used, or rather it was... Um, there was a clear change to not allow the use of nuclear power. Of course, that decision has, has been revised as of last week, and we will have three nuclear power plants on standby next year. So there were alternatives, um, but every conceptualization of alternative is always seen through the prism of cost and convenience. So any of you who buy books through Amazon 
knows that Amazon is not the only way you can buy books, but for many of us, it's the cheapest and most convenient. And I think we can apply that um, to the case of um, Russian energy uh, imports. If you look specifically at the case of post-Soviet states like Ukraine or even Lithuania, if you look at the early post-Soviet years, there was a sense that yes, it would be desirable to import fossil fuels from other states, but there was a sense that the cost of the infrastructure that would be needed, the cost of the pipelines that would be needed to import those um, oil supplies or natural gas supplies was so overwhelming that it was not, was not considered worth it. And it was only when there was a real political decision to, to do this, as in the case of Lithuania starting in 2007, then you see something like this happen. Thank you. Okay, I will ask a question of my own. Um, in the spirit of building those bridges between the humanities and the social sciences on these issues, um, I wanted to ask about a, a moment in the first chapter of your book, Margarita, where you say that um, you're building on work in cultural theory that reflects on the value of commodities above and beyond their exchange value. So I'm really interested in pondering the question of uh, the different cultural value that oil, coal, and natural gas have um, in Ukraine. And you spoke a little bit about discourse. In particular, you mentioned that oil is sort of excessively managed discursively. Meanwhile, coal is almost invisible, at least in European and American discussions of sanctions. So there's a kind of a discursive invisibility of coal. Um, and I just wondered if you could say a little bit about either the, I mean, is invisibility a value that coal has? Or could you say a little bit about um, what kind of different cultural values these different energy sources have in Ukraine specifically? So maybe not just thinking about how the European and American discussions of sanctions are taking place, but you know what? Is, how is coal discussed in Ukraine, particularly given that there is um, there is domestic production of Ukraine, or and that has been an important industry there in comparison with the oil and the natural gas, which is you know mainly coming from Russia. So, any comments on cultural or discursive value of these energy sources would be great. So thank you very much for your question. At first, I was a little bit afraid that you may, like, I may need to like remember what was in that footnote <laughs> on page fifteen, footnote three hundred and twenty-seven, uh, which I haven't read in, in a year. But um, the key point here is that uh, those cultural values of those different energy goods are very contextualized, and they are very different in different countries and different stages. Um, so that I think that is very important. I'm, I'm gonna. Talk for a moment. In a moment, I'm going to, to talk about um, about Ukraine. But before doing that, um, your question also brings a smile to my face because as I was working on this book for several years, I, I was going to have a chapter on Russian natural gas and the politics of value. I ended up not writing that chapter. Um, but the the point here, I, I this this a kind of preface, was uh, the fact that Russian natural gas was presented and it was largely uh, received as a high purity uh, good, a beautiful, perfect good, a bridge in the transition from fossil fuels to something else. Um, and natural gas was, again, even outside Russia, kind of uh, given a special status, at least in the context of these uh, other fossil fuels. Now, concerning specifically the case of Ukraine, uh, your focus on, or your question focusing on, on coal is really important because for Ukraine, coal was an element of pride. Coal continues to be an element of pride. And if you look at the early years after Ukrainian independence in 1991, Coal was discussed as that alternative that may allow Ukraine, to the extent that this was desired, to be energy independent from Russia. Now, in general, 
having studied that period in, in great detail, I know that energy dependency on Russia was not conceptualized as an existential threat very much in the early independence years, but nevertheless, coal was seen as that possible uh, counterweight to Russian oil or gas or fossil fuels in general. And that had two consequences. One consequence and had to do with the way in which the coal sector was managed in Ukraine. So I mentioned briefly uh, a few minutes ago how in almost every other country, including Russia, uh, the trend was towards the closing of mines that were not viable. In the case of Ukraine, in part because coal was seen as a counterweight to Russian fossil fuels, but also in part because of the value of employment in the coal sector, uh, coal was supported to a level that perhaps it shouldn't have been supported with all kinds of uh, implications down the road. Now, if we stay within Ukraine, there's a very, very interesting situation that happens here, which is a situation where the Soviet valuation of coal and coal miners in particular as ideal Soviet workers was in many ways transpassed into independent Ukraine to create a particular image of the miner as something not only to be protected by protecting those mines, but also something to be used as an available threat image that could be deployed politically. So if you have the chance to read chapter six in the book, which is my favorite, the, the chapter on coal and steel, you will see how those oligarchs uh, that ended up building some of the most important steel industries in the entire Europe in connection with the coal sector, they use the idea of coal miners as a potential threat. They use the image of the coal miners walking, marching into Kyiv. Uh, they use the popular fear of coal miners, a political player, as a way to gain in the, to gain autonomy from Kyiv to do basically their own thing, which was not always a very good thing. Um, and I think in that sense, that cultural view of the coal miner as both a hero, but also a slightly threatening figure was really very much um, instrumentalized by key economic actors, key oligarchic uh, actors. Um, so um, I recommend that you look at that chapter six where I deal with that. And actually I wrote several grant applications for this year to study exactly that topic uh, from a cultural perspective. I'm not going to be doing that. I'm going to be doing something else uh, this year, but that's a really, really interesting connection. How Soviet views of the coal miner interface with post-independence uh, Ukrainian views to create a certain discursive conceptualization and view of threat that allowed certain political actors and certain economic actors to gain more power. So to be, to be, to be discussed further. Thank you. I will certainly look forward to that. Um, I have a question in the chat from one of my students. Um, I'm very pleased to see, and so I will read it. Uh, what benefit did the Russian army see from attacking Ukrainian nuclear power plants? Well, I think we need to look at this in the context of the actual behavior of, of Russian of the Russian military in the last six months. And this is a behavior, the Russian military and the Russian leadership of basically trying to blackmail uh, Europe and the world, blackmailing the world. Uh, if you don't do as we want, you will freeze. If you don't do as we want, you will starve with the... Um, blocking of Ukrainian grain exports. And if you don't act as we will, you will succumb to perhaps a nuclear Armageddon. So uh, I don't think that there is a direct benefit to the Russian military. On the contrary, we already know what happened to Russian troops that were frolicking uh, around contaminated areas in, in other nuclear power plants. Um, it is, I think, part of a larger issue of uh, Russian very crude blackmail. 
um, of very important security needs of the population as a whole in Ukraine and outside Ukraine. If we don't have any more questions, then I think we can just thank our speaker. Thank you so much, Margarita, for starting us off this year. Um, this was great and just really, uh, really a great start to the series. So I hope to be able to connect with you in the future and talk to you more about your new work on coal and everything. Thank you so much for being there. You're very welcome. And um, before I say goodbye, I want to tell everybody what I'm going to be doing in the next few months. So I was supposed to go to Ukraine to study those steel oligarchs. Um, I devote a lot of uh, pages in my book to Azovstal. So I applied for two red fellowship to study those oligarchs in their interface with different uh, steel technologies in Ukraine. I'm not going to Ukraine because uh, nobody is going to Ukraine, but they allowed me to redo my project and they asked me to find other European countries where I could do it. And after a lot of legwork in many different capitals, I'm going to be going to Potsdam in Germany to the Institute of Advanced Sustainability Studies. And I'm going to be studying steel in a different perspective. I'm going to be looking at the industrial use of fossil fuels for non-electricity purposes, like you do in steel, but not only in steel, and looking at the geopolitics of carbon and decarbonization, including Russia, Ukraine, and China. So I hope I will not freeze because I just got an email from my host that the offices will be limited to 19 degrees centigrade. I've been trying to find out how much does that mean in Fahrenheit. And it's warm. It's warm? Mm -hmm. Okay, so no, he had like an exclamation mark. So I was very afraid. So no problem. <laughs> I'm still worried. I'm still worried what may happen, but um, I hope I will still be able to learn something uh, and to survive the heat the heat, the cold, and then the heat, because I'm sure they will not let any, any air conditioning next summer. It is 70. 70. Okay. okay. No problem. So thank you, everybody, for this very warm welcome. And uh, again, uh, to Gillian and Maya for organizing this great series.